Thank you, Mark. But I'm at the 8.30 service, so I needed to know that. So. Well, as Mark said, we're starting a new series this morning in the book of Colossians. And we're going to look at the first eight verses, Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. To the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our Father. We give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of which you previously heard in the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you just as in all the world also, it is constantly bearing fruit and increasing, even as it has been doing in you also since the day you heard of it and understood the grace of God in truth. You'll notice this is the second time he mentions the truth. He speaks of the word of God, the gospel as the truth. Just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow bondservant, who is a faithful servant of Christ on our behalf. And he also informed us of your love in the Spirit. May the Lord bless this reading of his word and bless our time of study in it together. Let's bow in prayer. The book of Colossians proves the saying that big things come in small packages. It is only four chapters long, but contains some of the most majestic images of Christ in the Bible. It was written to a church in the town of Colossae, located in the Lycus River Valley, about 100 miles east of the Mediterranean Sea and the city of Ephesus. So, in the western region of modern Turkey. It was on an important trade route and had a prosperous past. But when Paul wrote his letter, Colossae was just a shadow of its former self. It was a poor town. Other cities nearby were prospering. Laodicea and Hierapolis were wealthy. They prospered materially, but not spiritually. John would later call the church of Laodicea lukewarm. In contrast to that, the poor church of Colossae was warm. It was growing spiritually. Paul writes of the saints there, of their faith in Christ and love of the brethren. But there was a problem. It's not surprising. Whenever there is spiritual growth and vitality, the devil will visit the place and try to change all of that. He had visited the saints of Colossae. Strange ideas had entered the church from the east, brought there probably by merchants or travelers on the trade route. So men from the church visited Paul and asked him to write a letter to the church to refute the new cult that had come to town. The ideas of this cult are sketchy, but from what Paul says, we can gather that it was a combination of Greek philosophy, Jewish law, and Oriental mysticism. There was then, at the time, a variation of Judaism that was preoccupied with visions and taught that self-denial and strict law-keeping enabled the devotee to enter paradise through visions. This cult was like that with a, a mix of Christian ideas, but it was not Christian. Its emphasis on law keeping and diet, dreams, and even angelic beings detracted from the person and the work of Christ. Evidently, the false teachers taught that Christ was necessary, but Christ was only a beginning. In order to go on to maturity, and even in order to go on to become spiritually elite, it was necessary to follow their philosophy and rules. 
So Paul answered their devaluation of Christ by highlighting his greatness, stressing the supremacy of Christ and the sufficiency of Christ, the deity of Christ, and the redemption in Christ and Christ alone. The preacher of Ecclesiastes wrote, there is nothing new under the sun. Nothing is being said today that wasn't said yesterday. Many ideas of the present are largely retreads of the past. Some time ago, Warren Wearsby, who was for a number of years the pastor teacher of Moody Church in Chicago, wrote on the manifestation of this old heresy today. I hear too many voices, he wrote, telling me that I need something more than Jesus Christ, some exciting experience, some new doctrine, some addition to my Christian experience. But Paul affirms that what I need is appropriation of what I already have in Christ. That's true. That's what Paul teaches in this book. That's what he told the Colossian saints in chapter 2 when he says, in Him you have been made complete. Paul had never been to... Colossae. He'd never met the Colossians, but he could say that of them. He could say that they were complete because it's true of every believer in Jesus Christ. We are complete in Him at the moment of regeneration and faith. Complete. We don't need laws like circumcision or even baptism to finish our justification. We don't Need laws for diet or dress, Old Testament laws to complete our sanctification or ensure our glorification. We are complete in Christ and we have all we need, born again whole, just as a newborn child is born with all of its parts. We need to grow, of course, as infants need to grow, and it's a sad thing When a child of God who has all of the parts doesn't mature, we need to grow. But we don't do that by following a lot of man-made rules or mystical experiences. Christians are so easily drawn to those things. They're so easily drawn into legalistic ways of life and forget their walk with God. Their walk with God. Is that too simple? That's how we grow. That's how spiritual development happens. It's by knowing Christ. It's by knowing His Word and living by faith. In fact, in chapter 2 and verse 3, Paul will say, in whom, that is in Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Wisdom and knowledge is found in Him and Him alone. And that's where he, why he will exalt Jesus Christ so greatly in this book. Now, if Paul had never visited Colossae, how did a church begin there? Two men played an important part in that, Epaphras and Philemon. We know Philemon from the book of Philemon. The church met in his home. Epaphras is mentioned in the book of Colossians twice. Philemon is mentioned once. Epaphras was likely converted during Paul's ministry in Ephesus. In Acts chapter 19 and verse 10, Luke wrote that during Paul's two-year ministry there, all who lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord. And Asia is the province of Asia, which was in the western part of Asia Minor where Ephesus was. And, And so from there, that city, the gospel spread widely to surrounding cities in that province of Asia where new converts... And men sent by Paul went out to cities in the region. That included Colossae, 100 miles away, when Epaphras went to the Lycus Valley to evangelize the region. Years had passed, and the church had grown. Paul, in the meantime, had moved on. He had traveled to Jerusalem, where he was arrested, spent two years in jail in Caesarea before being sent to Rome where he was imprisoned while waiting for his trial before Caesar. It was there that he was visited by Epaphras who told him about the situation in Colossae. And so from there in Rome, Paul wrote his letter to the Colossians. It's one of a group 
known as Paul's prison epistles. The others are the books of Ephesians, Philippians, and Philemon. And here in this fourth prison epistle, Paul wasted no time getting to the heart of the matter, the supremacy of Christ. Early in the first chapter, he describes him as the Redeemer and the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. He is God the Son, the eternal Son of God and heir of all things. The universe, all of its galaxies and all of its vastness and greatness and all that's in this world and all of its beings, all of that is His. He is the revelation of the invisible God and creator of everything. He is the sustainer of all things. He is before all things, Paul wrote. And in Him all things hold together. He made everything, time and space, material and immaterial, physical and spiritual. He upholds it, maintains it, and He saves sinners by His infinite and eternal sacrifice, and they stay saved. That is the greatness of Christ. Do we really need anything more than Him? Do we really need anything more than the Almighty? I think Paul couldn't wait to make known all of that to the Colossians. But first he had to say hello. And so he begins his letter with a greeting. It's a formal greeting in that it's one typical of the apostle. But it's no mere formality. It's genuine and warm. It's also necessary. He states the authority for all that he has written. Everything that they will read and consider has absolute authority behind it. And he shows that by identifying himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ. Timothy was with him. Maybe Timothy was serving as his amanuensis, his secretary, writing down the things that Paul was dictating. But Timothy was not an apostle. Only Paul was that. He was Christ's representative and messenger on earth. And he hadn't become an apostle by his choice. He hadn't been, become an apostle by the election of a church. There wasn't a college of cardinals that elected him to that office. He was sovereignly chosen by God. He was snatched up by Christ on the Damascus Road and made a special messenger to the Gentiles. If you want to see an example of saving sovereign grace, read Acts chapter 9 and the conversion of the Apostle Paul. You know the story. You know what happened. He had letters from the high priests. He had names in those letters. He knew who the Christians were in Damascus, and he was going there to snuff them out, to arrest them, imprison them, and wipe out the name of Jesus Christ from the face of the earth. He was going to Damascus with determination, with his jaw clenched, when suddenly there was a light that knocked him down to his, his face on the ground. And out of that, Paul addressed the Lord Jesus Christ as that. He called Jesus Lord. What a miracle. What a change that took place. That is an example of a sinner being snatched from the burning. Paul didn't seek him. The Lord sought Paul. Paul certainly agreed with everything the Lord said and joyfully entered into this new relationship. Couldn't believe the greatness of the grace of God that it would save a man like Paul. But it saved a man like Paul because God chose him. Christ sought him and found him and snatched him up, arrested him spiritually as it were on the Damascus Road and made him his great apostle. It was by the will of God, Paul says. Therefore, what Paul wrote is as if Christ had written it. Therefore, it is to be believed and followed. The cult he would counter was built on speculation. It was built on human ideas. It was built on false ideas. Paul's response was divine revelation. It is truth. That, by the way, is where we begin when we read the Bible. 
In fact, you'll never understand the Bible if you don't begin with the knowledge, the conviction, the belief that it is truth. This is what our, our, this is our presupposition, which is to say it's our starting point. This is where we begin. The absolute be beginning is this book, all 66 books, this is truth. Now we have to think about it. We have to study it. We don't always get it right when we're interpreting a passage. But nevertheless, it is truth. It's not opinion. Now if that seems to be begging the question, meaning assuming the truth of a statement without first proving it, well the answer to that is the self-revelation of the Bible. It claims to be true. It purports to be the Word of God, the revelation of the triune God. And that is the inborn, natural understanding of Paul's readers. In verse 2, he calls them saints. That doesn't mean that they are a, a, an elite group of people in the church, a, a special group within the church. All believers are saints. But it describes the believer, the Christian, as, as holy. That word saint is built on the word holy. And what that means is set apart. One chosen out of the world by God, set apart for himself, set apart for a relationship with himself, set apart for service for him. So a saint is a set apart one. So they know. They have spiritual eyes to see and ears to hear. They are equipped with a new mind to understand and the Holy Spirit to teach them. All, all of that is part of what we have in the new birth, in regeneration. We are equipped with new minds, new hearts. We have the, the, the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit within us who is the seal upon our hearts and has sealed us for the day of redemption. And so because of all that, they know this is God's revelation. Because you're born again, you know this is God's Word. And when you have doubts about that, read it. Spend time reading it, and it will confirm to you that this is true. It speaks to you. The Spirit of God speaks to your heart through that. And Paul expresses great confidence in these Colossians that they will respond well to what he has written to them because he calls them faithful brethren in Christ. They believed the gospel, and they obeyed the Lord. Well, as I said, this was not a rich church like the church in Laodicea, but it was a faithful church. And that's what the Apostle Paul valued. That is what Christ values, faithfulness. For all that the Laodicean Christians had, and they had a lot, they had a lot of material riches, and those are a great blessing, but those material, those material riches cannot compare to what they lacked. And what they lacked was true zeal for the Lord. They lacked a love for Him and a zeal and interest in His Word. They were worldly. They were a self-satisfied bunch. So in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 16, Jesus threatened to spit them out. Material things, as I said, are a blessing. And we should be thankful for them. But they can distract from what is most important. They can dull a person's mind and dull a person's faith. The Colossians weren't rich, but they were faithful. And Paul had every reason to believe that they would respond to his brief epistle and receive the blessings that he hoped for them. And what those blessings were are simply stated at the end of verse 2, grace and peace. Now that was a, a typical Jewish greeting, peace, shalom, and in fact it was more fully mercy and peace. But again, it, it was more than a formality when he's saying this. That, that often people would speak, well, peace to you, and just, it was a formality, but not with Paul. He meant it for these Colossian saints. The, and the two go together. Peace or shalom is not uh, simply a negative. It's not simply the absence of war, the absence of conflict. It is all also something, and really chiefly something positive. It has the idea of well-being, 
That's what one is wishing for the other person when they say shalom or peace, well-being, which ultimately is the result of grace, of God's undeserved, unconditional favor. But, but how much more likely is peace to be a Christian experience when he or she is faithful, is believing of God's word and obedient to it? Peace is certain in that case to be their experience. And Paul, Paul's confidence in these Colossian saints to receive that, to receive his word, to receive this revelation is stated even more clearly in the next verses, verses 3 and 4, where he speaks of his thankfulness for them. He didn't know them personally, as I've, I've stated. He never had traveled there, never visited the city. But he knew them, and he knew them by reputation. And he had for some time. He had prayed for them routinely. He says that in verse 3. He and Timothy gave thanks to God for them having heard of their faith in Christ and love for all the saints. Not just some of the saints, he says, not just those that they were familiar with, those that had personalities that sort of met, matched up with theirs and they felt comfortable with. There are all kinds of people in the church and we're not perhaps comfortable with some as we are with others. It was the same there, but they loved them all. And that was characteristic of them. They had a love for all of the saints. Love for God's people is the evidence of genuine faith. Not the only evidence, but certainly one of the fundamental evidences of real faith. Faith in Christ joins us to Christ, which joins us to His body, to His church, to His elect. And we will love them because we love Him, we'll love them and care for them. Now, the faith Paul speaks of here is not only saving faith, faith into Christ. It is also, and I think mainly here, faith that occurs in Christ, that is in the environment of Christ. And let me illustrate that. There are two different Greek prepositions for the word in. There's the word ace, epsilon, iota, sigma, which we could transliterate, E-I-S, and the word in epsilon nu, or our, the equivalent to our in. So to illustrate the difference between these, when you came to Believer's Chapel this morning, you parked outside and you walked into ACE, the building. And once you entered into the building, you are in the building and in the atmosphere of the building. Well, it's this second meaning, in, in the atmosphere that Paul is speaking of here. And what he's saying is your faith is grounded in Christ. And like a tree that's planted in good soil and draws its nutrients and flourishes as a plant in the good soil and the good atmosphere, they were doing that in Christ. They were drawing from His life and His life was strengthening their faith. Their, their faith was flourishing in Him. And so having believed into Christ, having entered Him, they were in Christ, living in Him, believing His Word daily, and acting in love. That characterized them. They had a living faith. And the reason for this is given in verse 5. The evidence of it, I again say, is their love for the brethren. But the, the thing that galvanized this faith, it, it's caused by their union with Christ, but what gave motivation to it is what he says next. It's their hope. They lived by faith and acted in love because of the hope, Paul said, laid up for you in heaven. Hope is about the future. And they knew their future was certain, and they knew their future was glorious. Now, they didn't have that paganism. Paul described the Ephesians before the gospel came to them as, as having no hope and without God in the world. Well, the Colossians, a hundred miles east, were no different. They lived in darkness, ignorance, fear, 
Then they heard the gospel of forgiveness and eternal life. And when they heard that message, by the grace of God, it rang true. And they believed it. And they believed in Christ. The future was now bright. They had the confident expectation of heaven to come and the resurrection of the body and the kingdom to come, world without end. That was their hope. That's our hope. It's not a wish. Christian hope is not a wish as it is with the world. Store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in or steal. That's what the Colossians were doing. They lived not only in Christ and with their faith for us, they lived in their hope. When people lack hope, they lack purpose. They despair, they give up. They become uncaring and inactive. Christians alone in this world have hope. We have a glorious future that will soon be ours. Life's over shortly. And we enter into that great hope that we have. Well, that motivated and galvanized the Colossians in their faith and love. For this reason, because they, they all shared the same hope and destiny, they made sacrifices. They made sacrifices for Christ. They made sacrifices for each other. They, they were running the race of faith together to the heavenly city. And so in doing that, they helped each other along, strengthening the hands that were weak and the knees that were feeble. People don't do that if there is no future. If life is, is meaningless, if life is hopeless, going nowhere, people don't act in a selfless manner. The Colossians knew that it was not going nowhere. They knew that life was not without meaning. They had new meaning, they had purpose, they had hope, and so they knew that what they did today was of eternal weight and value. They had hope. And had it from the time that Epaphras came to them and gave them the gospel, what Paul calls in verse 5, the word of truth. Now again, calling the gospel truth, absolute truth, may seem to be begging the question, meaning it may seem to be assuming one's conclusion to be correct before proving it. After all, the cultists, who came to Colossae were challenging the truth of the gospel. They, they had something new that uh, promised secrets that opened up the universe and had the credibility of philosophy. Well, they had weighty things to say. They were erudite men. All seemed to lend, lend credibility to what they said. Again, the gospel is its own proof. Just as the sun shining at high noon is its own proof. You don't need to go outside and debate whether the sun is shining at, at noon on an August day in Texas. It, it, it demonstrates itself. And the gospel, all of the word of God. And, and I like Abraham Kuyper, who the Dutch theologian who spoke of the gospel, defined it as all of the Word of God. From Genesis to Revelation, it is the good news. It's not just the message we give of salvation. The whole of the Word of God is the gospel, and it is truth. It is self-authenticating. It rings true for those who have ears to hear. And Paul wrote of the eyes of your heart in Ephesians 1.18, the, the spiritual ability that we have to receive truth, to receive the light of, of God's revelation, to understand it. And our spiritual eyes have been opened. They're not blind. We have open eyes, open spiritual eyes. We see what others cannot see, what others cannot know. The truth of the gospel proves itself to us just, again, as the sun on a clear day proves itself to a person with seeing eyes. We know by God's grace that it is true. We believe it with certainty. We see it by God's grace because faith is his gift. That's indicated in verses 3 and 4 where Paul gives thanks to God for their faith. I wouldn't thank God for their faith if faith was not a gift. 
If faith was something that they mustered up in their own strength and ability, why would he thank God for the faith that they gave themselves? Now, faith is a gift, and because we have that great gift of faith, which is the torch that lights up the world and the Word of God for us, we're able to see. And so Paul thanked God because he gave them this faith, this illuminating faith. So by his grace, we see and know intuitively, we know automatically, and we know with certainty. Still, there is external evidence for the truth of the gospel. It's not just that it says it's true and we believe it. Fundamentally, that is right. But there, there is proof of it. Fulfilled prophecy is proof. Historical accuracy in the Word of God is proof. And there are other things. And Paul refers to the other things in verse 6, the other proof. And the other proof is the Colossians themselves. And multitude of other, uh, uh, multitudes of others like them across the world. The gospel, Paul said, came to them, as it has to many others, constantly bearing fruit. And that fruit that it bears in their lives is the proof, the evidence of the truth of it. Gospel is not static. It is dynamic. It is living and active, according to Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. It's like a sword or like a, a sharp knife that divides, it separates, it analyzes and corrects. It sanctifies, according to Jesus in John 17, verse 17. It bears fruit, Paul says here. It changes lives. It changes us. And the Colossians were proof of that. They were proof of the, the reality of all of that. They were largely Gentiles, saved out of paganism, and brought into the church with new lives for all of the world to see, for all of that pagan city of Colossae to see. These people are different. For everyone in the Lycus Valley to see, these people are different. Lives that had been characterized by immorality, idolatry, and sorcery, and strife, the deeds of the flesh, were now characterized by the fruit of the Spirit. Love, and joy, peace, goodness, long-suffering. All of the, the virtues of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. It's hard to argue against a changed life. Hard to argue against virtue. Especially one so dramatically changed and virtuous as their lives were. The gospel does what philosophy cannot do. Acts 17 gives us, an gives us an example of the impotence of philosophy with the lazy, arrogant men of Mars Hill. They were talkers. They were fascinated with some new thought, but they were not new men. They were idle, useless men. The Word of God changes men. It changes people. The Colossians were bearing fruit, Paul said. They, they, they weren't the only examples of that either. The gospel was increasing, he said, in all the world. That is miraculous. Think of it. When Jesus was crucified, ten of his disciples had run away and were hiding. One had betrayed him, and one was with a small group of women standing off some distance from the cross. When the Lord's body was placed in the tomb, no one who had followed him had any hope. The Lord died alone with all of his friends in despair. Three days later, the resurrection. Thirty years later, the church was filling the world and increasing. Some religions spread their new faith with the sword. Christianity spread by the word. Less than 150 years after Paul wrote Colossians, the church father Tertullian wrote of the gospel and the changes it brought to the world peacefully. He spoke to the Roman Empire and said, we are but of yesterday, and yet we already fill your cities, islands, camps, your palace, senate, forum. We have left you only your temples. 
It wasn't long before those temples were abandoned. It's one of the miracles of history when you think about it. Paganism dominated the continent of Europe for millennia. And then the gospel came along. And within a few short years, paganism was gone. Completely. That's the power of the gospel. Christ said, I will build my church. And against the powers of darkness, he has done that and he is doing that. And it is, as I say, supernatural. And proof of the grace of God in truth. The truth of the gospel. That sovereign grace works through faithful men, though. Men like Epaphras, who brought the gospel to the Lycus Valley. Paul calls him a fellow bondservant and faithful servant of Christ. He was the source of Paul's information about the Colossians and about the problems in the church, but also about their strengths. And what he speaks of in verse 8 as their love in the Spirit. Now this is the only verse in the book of Colossians where the Holy Spirit is explicitly mentioned. This is a book mainly about Jesus Christ and His sufficiency as God's Son. In fact, later in verse 27, rather than speak of the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, Paul speaks of Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's a distinction without much of a difference. Christ is in every believer through the Holy Spirit. Their ministries are distinct from each other, but they're inextricably connected to each other. The life of Christ is given to us through the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. But, but all of this it only brings out the real nature of the Christian life and the reason for the spread of the Christian faith. Again, it is supernatural. It is due to the Spirit of God in us, working in us through the Scriptures, through the Word of God, to change us. The, the dramatic change in these Gentiles was due to the Holy Spirit working through Scripture, working through the Word of God to change them, to produce in them love, so that they became selfless servants. Servants of one another, servants of Christ. And for a person, a natural person, to become a selfless servant takes a miracle of the work of God. And he makes the gospel message effective when men like Epaphras preach it among the pagans so that they see the truth of it and they believe. It's not that, that Epaphras or any evangelist is effective through their own eloquence or skill in debate. Uh, all of that is good. God gifts people with abilities, with a clear mind, uh, with articulate speech. All that's good and necessary and, and, and useful in clarifying the gospel and teaching it and in drawing people to the truth. God uses all of that, but ultimately, it, it's not the power and the gifts of men. It's the power and the gift of the Holy Spirit that opens hearts to receive the truth. Ultimately, it's His work. That's why lives were changed in Colossae and in all the world. We live in a world very much like the world of these Colossians. It's full of fear and anxiety, uncertainty due to everything from, from terrorism to superbugs. It's a dangerous world. And a world without hope and without God without any belief in God. I read a book back in 2017, just really a few months ago, which is an introduction to the thought of Martin Luther. And I read it because 2017 marks the 500th anniversary of the beginning of the Reformation. So I read really a number of books about Luther and his, his thoughts, his letters and things like that. Well, this book was written by a German writer. In the last chapter, he stated that in our day, it is exceedingly difficult to defend any attempt to speak about God. People don't believe in it. But notice what he said, though. 
it's difficult to defend any attempt to speak about God. It's even hard to attempt to bring up the subject because people do not believe Him. We are in a very secular world. In Luther's day, the existence of God was a general assumption. No one questioned it. The doctrine of the Trinity was almost universally accepted in Europe, in Christendom at that time. The situation today is fundamentally changed. The idea of God as a whole, the author wrote, has finally and irrevocably ceased to be accepted. Irrevocably. Now that book was published in 1964. Things have not improved over 50 years. They've gotten worse. They've gotten darker. We are living in the days of the Colossians and the Apostles in a kind of materialistic neo-paganism. Without hope, and without God in the world, and increasingly without morals. It is a frightening world we live in. But the gospel that was recognized to be the word of truth, absolute truth, in ancient Colossae, in pagan Colossae, is the same word of truth that we have. And the Holy Spirit is working through it today just as He did then, opening hearts to believe it now as He did then. Nothing can frustrate His work. That hasn't changed. It is, again, supernatural. We have the one true message, the message of salvation for the lost, the message of forgiveness of sin and eternal life. So we should tell it. We have the message of hope. So we should live with hope. It should be reflected in our conversation and behavior. We have hope and we have peace. We have shalom. We have well-being. The world seems on fire all around us. That's reality. But while we are in the world, in this dangerous world, this world of flame. More importantly, we are in Christ who holds all things together. He is our fortress. The world should see that in our lives and it should hear that in our voices, in our conversation. We have hope and it's in the Savior who is the Savior of the world. Paul could write that confidently, joyfully from jail. From jail. Because he had hope. So if you're here without Him, if you have not believed in Jesus Christ, we invite you to come to Him, to trust in Him for salvation. It's real hope that we offer you, that the Gospel offers you. He came to die for sinners. He calls sinners to Himself. If you know that you are guilty, that you are a sinner, flee to Christ. He receives all who do. His sacrifice will cleanse you from sin and give you everlasting life and you'll have hope and you'll have a new life in which you can live for Him and store up treasures for heaven. Treasures in heaven. May God help you do that. Help all of us to do that. To set our minds upon Him. Set our minds on the things above as Paul would encourage us to do. Let's pray. Father, we do thank You for Your goodness to us. What a... What a blessing to have this book before us. A brief book, but uh, big things come in small packages. And that's certainly true of this four-chapter letter to the Colossians. And I pray that as we study it in the weeks to come, you would bless us with a deeper understanding of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, an understanding of the Godhead, of the triune God, and how you are working for us and blessing us so Lord, do that, teach us, build us up in the faith, give us this week a desire to know you, to study you, to walk with you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.